one about the um, the definition of chametz and how we have to remove it. Now, there's a whole process on how you're supposed to kosh your kitchen. There is a process on how you're supposed to kosh your kitchen. The general principle is that the way that the flavor goes into, uh, and I remember, chametz means you're not allowed to have any any fermented products in, in your home for the eight days of Pesach starting from Monday at uh, late morning, about 11.30 a.m. You're not allowed to have it in your possession. What does that mean? It means no bread, no pasta, nothing made out of fermented grains, which is wheat, barley, spelt, oats, and rye. Basically, it's got to be kosher. It's got to be kosher for Passover in order to be allowed into your home. Now, understand that this might not be easy for you, but try, 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 go for it. Do eight days, you know, try to remove any obvious chametz from your home. Anything that you have, here's what you do. You just lock it up in a cabinet. Right, you take a cabinet, your pantry, and you lock it up for Pesach. And then what you do is, is that you sell your chametz. What you do is, there's a form you fill out here at the shul. It's on every matzah box. It's in the emails. You fill out the form. You sell your chametz. And now what happens is, you no longer own the chametz or the property that it's on for the duration of Pesach. And therefore, the chametz, even though it's in your house, it's not technically owned by you, and you are no longer violating the prohibition of owning chametz and Pesach. So you need to sell your chametz. It's very, very, very important. This is what Jews have done since time immemorial. Um, if you're going to, now remember something else, that chametz means not only the actual bread, but even the dishes that were used <coughs> to eat or, or cook chametz or bake chametz, they also become chametz. Like we learned in, in the laws of kosher and treif, that the flavor is, it's not only the food that's treif, but the flavor of the food that's treif. So if you had a bacon and the bacon was, was eaten on a, on a plate, then the plate also has bacon. Right, even though it's clean, the plate is clean, but still the bacon is inside the plate because because it, it went in through a state of um, through a state of of heat. Right. By the way, this is the forms for selling your chametz. You can get them here at the Shul Chabad of Hamish Gardens. You can also go online and do it easily online at JewishGardens.com forward slash set me free. That's JewishGardens.com forward slash set me free. Let me triple check that. Make sure that's the right link. Yes, it is. JewishGardens.com forward slash set me free. Now, if you have flavor of bacon in a dish, that person most likely is not interested in keeping kosher. I disagree with you. Respectfully disagree with you. Can you explain? I respectfully disagree with you. What was that? The sale. Um, a little bit. I mean, we're not actually... One thing at a time. I've just got two questions uh, flying. Let me just repeat the question here. Somebody just asked a question for the viewers online um, that a person who has bacon in his plates probably doesn't care about um, the bacon in his plates. So respectfully, Volvo, I disagree with your question because it could be that a person's rising to higher observance and he say, and he realizes that he's going to try to keep kosher and he says, okay, as long as I don't have bacon in my house, I'm good. But what, what he needs to learn is that even the flavor in the dishes is, 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 is treif and therefore he has to kosher his vessels as well. You understand? So, and maybe, maybe he doesn't care, but maybe he has a child that cares or a parent that cares or a brother-in-law that cares. And then he invites him to his house, and then and then the brother-in-law says, "I'm sorry, I can't eat your dishes." And the guy's like, "What do you mean you can't eat my dishes? They're clean." And he explains to him, "No, I can't eat on it because instead." So, so you have to understand that the prohibition of, of food is not only the food itself; it's also the flavor of the food that's inside of the vessels. Um, and that would apply to non-kosher food all year round. It would also apply to non-kosher for Pesach food on Pesach. Therefore, you need to kosher. The general rule with koshering dishes is like this: is that the same way? That the food goes into the food, the flavor goes into the dish, is the way it comes out of the dish. And therefore, if it went in through wet heat, through wet heat, through hot water, then it goes out through wet heat, through hot water. You pour boiling water on it, it comes out. And if it went in through dry heat, for example, uh, an oven, then it gets cleaned through dry heat, which is why the ovens have a self-cleaning mode. When you turn your oven on the self-cleaning mode, that is cleansing the oven in a way of uh, intense dry heat that will typically kosher it to the point that's kosher for Pesach. Does so a dishwasher count? A dishwasher is a very complicated process because the dishwasher becomes trafe through wet heat, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if you don't keep meat and milk and the whole thing's trafe, right? Um, it becomes trafe through wet, through wet heat. So theoretically, theoretically, if you ran three cycles, empty cycles, with bleach inside, then the bleach would purge of any flavor and it, it would technically serve however uh there's different levels of observance if you're on a higher level of, on, of observance then you'll notice that there's rubber around the edges of the dishwasher and sometimes you know the rollers they're made of rubber and their rubber is not kosherable 
the different materials that are kosherable, different that aren't, some of that aren't. So if you have of, of higher absorbent, you wouldn't want to do it that way. But if you're not going to do any other way, and this is all that you're going to do, then go for this way. You understand? Back to your question, Chuck. Chuck was asking a question. What was the question about selling the chametz? Yes, sir. How does putting out this form result in a sale? Marty. Because this form, the question is, how does filling out this form result? The question was asked, how does filling this form result in me not owning my chametz in Pesach? Because selling it, because it, it, right? that's what you're signing when you put yeah, your signature yeah. at the bottom. How, how am I selling? Because when you put your signature at the bottom, yeah, you're affirming the contract. That's why. It's a contract. This is a contract. He takes but nothing it. actually is sold. Yes, it is. He well, takes it along with everybody else's. <coughs> oh, I have to properly. bring it to you. No, no, you don't. You have to bring me this. You have to bring me this he signed document. Power to sell. He, you're he empowering me as your power of attorney. That's yeah, what you're doing. Power, power of you're giving me power, power of attorney, attorney to sell your chametz for you. But how does the sale print? It's not going to sell it. It's form right. over substance. Yeah, thank you. Got it. Okay. So, um, so, so, so I just wanted to touch. I just wanted to. I just wanted to touch on this idea that you you kosher your vessels on on Pesach. In other words, you want to make sure that this Pesach you're not eating any pastas, any breads, any cereals, any foods that are fermented grain products. You want to purchase in your home only foods that are kosher for Passover. During Pesach, if you go to Publix, if you go to the kosher store, you'll notice there's a, a there's an there's a large plethora of a large selection. There is a large selection of products that are kosher for Passover. There's there's a tremendous amount. You really will not be going hungry, uh, you know, if you're if you keep in Pesach. But it is a biblical prohibition to not only eat chametz but also to possess the chametz. So please sell your chametz, thus you won't be possessing it. Clean your house, sequester. The chametz products into the garage, into one room, leave them there, or various rooms or cabinets, and leave them there. And you actually seal those closets. You can actually take some tape, seal those closets, and you can write of it, not, not kosher for Passover. Those cabinets, those rooms, those pantries, and they are put aside and not to be accessed during Pesach because we sell them to the non Jew who's allowed to own them on Passover. There's no prohibition for a non Jew to own. Uh, uh, to own chametz and Pesach. It's only the Jew that's been commanded that he's not allowed to own chametz and Pesach. But with that being said, if you're rising to higher observance, then what I want you to do is to consider this idea of koshering your, your vessels on Pesach as well. Now, many people that can afford to don't kosher the vessels on Pesach. What do they do? They have a third set of dishes, which they bring out on Passover. What that means is you just put away your, your chametz dishes, don't use them, because you know maybe you can afford more than one uh, dinner set, right? Maybe you can't afford more than one spoon and fork and a knife, right? And if you can, then what you do is you take your chametz dishes, you seal those cabinets where they are in, mm -hmm. mark them non kosher for Pesach, and then you have a special chametz cabinet. Sorry, a, a Passover cabinet inside of my kitchen. I've got two huge cabinets we never touch all year round, and they are the, the Pesach cabinets. So what I do in my kitchen is like this. Um, I cut, I, we clean the whole kitchen. We seal the cabinets that we don't want to be using for Pesach. We just seal them. We cover the countertops with special foil uh, that you can buy, which is like a countertop kind of foil. So it's a, so nothing's touching the surface, mm -hmm. right? I actually blowtorch the uh, the sinks, and uh, I have a huge blowtorch. Yeah. Blowtorch. Blowtorch. Well, this is koshering. I wouldn't trust them with a blowtorch. Of the eight-day period, the days you're not allowed to drive, which is like Shabbos, right. is the first two days and the last two days. So that would be... Monday night next week until Wednesday night, then Thursday, Friday, Sunday is the in-between days of the holiday, which is still the holiday, but, and you're not allowed to eat chametz, you can't eat fermented grains, but you're allowed to drive. You shouldn't really work because it's still yuntif, it's still a holy day, but it's family time, it's, you know, it's, it's awesome, but, but, but you are allowed to to do stuff like riding and, uh, you know, driving and yeah, cell phones. Driving, yeah. Then then at the end, at the back end, Sunday night until Tuesday night on the back end, which is in two weeks from now, those are the last two days of Pesach where we will have, um, there'll be a Yizkar over there, Yizkar memorial service. There'll be a Mashiach Farbrengen, which we'll tell you about. But And, and the prohibition of eating chametz begins next Monday around early, late, late morning, all the way through till the following Tuesday night as marked in the calendar. Oh, in terms of work done at the shul, uh, we really sh yeah, should not be doing much work during those days. Certainly not the first two days and last two days. No, of course. Definitely not. The only day we'd really be like even 
uh, able to consider really would be that one Thursday, which is a very kind of weird, this is one day stuck in the middle. So what we do is we just, we just say, you know what, we leave it. So, so ideally we don't want to do any work. Yeah. If we can't do it before, then we wouldn't want to do it at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyways, back, back to the crash course folks. Uh, did I answer your question? Did you have a question? Oh, so I wanted to say this in my kitchen, we have two huge cabinets that uh, we just, we open them up. And now they have everything that we need for Pesach. The, you know, the dishes. And so, oh, so I was talking about the blowtorch. The blowtorch I bring out. What I do with the ovens is I put them in self-clean. And we bought ovens that have self-cleaning function, right? Yeah. Right? So they all self-clean themselves. The countertops are clean. The, the, now, the, the, um, the actual sinks, I blowtorch because, you know, you're kind of using them. It's hard to, like, cover the sinks, right? So I blowtorch. I make them kosher for Pesach. Remember, the flavor comes in through wet heat. So it comes out through wet heat which would be boiling water. Boiling water is a little dangerous. I once hurt myself with it. So so using a blowtorch is a higher oh, that's level. Than, than it's safer, yeah. It's, okay. it's safer than, than, <laughs> than pouring boiling water. Yeah, so it's, but it's more powerful. It's more more intense purging when you use dry heat, than, even than if you use wet heat. So, it's, so it includes that kosher level. And that, But a lot of people, you know what they do for Pesach? They have a Pesach kitchen, which means they, they actually have a separate room in their house. Where, where they open the room and it's got a sink. My parents have this. It's got a, it's got a sink and an oven and a, and like it's an actual kitchen where they do all their cooking for Pesach. So that way they don't have to do this whole kitchen changeover in the first place. Other people that can afford it just go to a Pesach program. They lock their house. They go to a special hotel where there's like PJ National over here has a huge Pesach program every year. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Jews come from around the world. You know, like yeah, patriarchs and matriarchs will invite. Yeah, yeah, people will invite. Over the whole hotel. What, why are you making a face? Are you surprised? You don't know? Just, yeah, they, uh, just they wait. Next Monday. Next Monday, you'll start seeing a lot of religious people around here. Yeah. What happens is, if people that can afford it, they have, you know, six kids and then 30, 40, 50 grandkids. Yeah. They'll, they'll take, you know, 15, 20 rooms in the hotel. It's right. not cheap. And every meal, it's like a cruise. It's like a cruise yeah. ship. Every single meal, three times a day, plus the tea room, wherever you move, wherever you look, there's food somewhere, but it's catered and they don't have to clean their pace at their homes. But it's a beautiful family retreat. It's a beautiful experience. If you can afford, you got to spare forty, fifty thousand dollars. I think, uh, yeah, yeah, for eight days. Absolutely. It's, not, it's like a cruise, same thing as a cruise, you know, just that it's kosher for Pesach and there's lectures and um probably yeah probably oh now paper plates a very interesting question very interesting question being asked right now about paper plates what happens if you don't want to kosher your dishes and you also don't want to buy new dishes for whatever reason how about paper plates now paper plates not that simple the answer is yes paper plates are good um plastic plates are probably better because paper plates have a glue on it you know, when they put them together, there's a certain glue they put on it. What's the glue made out of? Pig. No. Well, a lot of no. Made out of Glue's made out of starch. Starch, which is uh, fermented grains. You know, it takes some sort of a, like a wheat or something, and they that's how they make the paste, right? So that theoretically could be chametz, which is why you want to get your, your paper goods from a kosher store that has it marked as kosher for Passover. Now, I don't know if the, pla if the plastic plates really have any of those kind of coatings. Right. If anything, maybe a wax coating, but not a starch coating. You understand? So it's just an interesting sensitivity mm -hmm. um, of, of, of how careful, how meticulous we are when it comes to Pesach to being able to observe the sensitivities of Pesach. Right? Sunflower seeds are kosher for Pesach because they're not one of the five grains, wheat, barley, spelt, oats, and rye, which when mixed with water for a duration of 18 minutes would become chametz. However, it was the rabbis of Ashkenaz, of the German, of, of, uh, of, of the Christian nations, the rabbis living in Christian countries, the Ashkenazi Jews, who decreed on legumes, oh, right? Legumes. We went through that already, right? That kidney as legumes is considered anything which could be ground into a flower. And I believe sunflower seeds could be ground into a flower. And therefore, they, they banned it on Pesach. However, the Sephardic Jews, the Jews of, the, the Jews of Arab lands, never accepted that prohibition, never never took upon themselves that stringency, and that's why they probably would eat sunflower. Much better food in the Sephardic homes on Pesach than the Ashkenazi, home, Ashkenazi homes, but, you know, you got to take your pick. Plastic, okay. Plastic, you can't say we're okay. Okay, let's go. We're going to do a very interesting ritual right now, which is the ritual of Sunday night. I'm sorry, what? The plastic you can't say we're okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd be okay with that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Especially, guys, you know, we have a kosher store now. We have a kosher store, and it's local. It's right here in Boynton Beach, Right? Right, it's better than uh, better than flying out there than driving out to Miami. 
It's right in. I advise you. I urge you. Please go to the kosher store. It's on. It's on. Uh, I've never been there, but it's on Boynton Beach Boulevard. No, Woolbright. I think it's on Woolbright. 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 It's very easy to find. It's the largest kosher store south of New York City. It's the largest. Pretty close. It's the largest kosher store south of New York City, guys. We have the very great privilege, you know. Other other cities, they have a little kosher store. It's the size of a, of a postage stamp. This is the size of a Publix, okay? What you do is you walk in there, go there before Pesach. It's not going to be cheap, but you know what? You're going to be able to stock up with everything that you need for Pesach. One stop shop. You'll find counter covers. You'll find sink inserts. You'll find um, all sorts of interesting kosher for Passover, tin foil, uh, aluminum pans. Everything over there is kosher. Go in, indulge, and experience a kosher for Pesach, Pesach this year. But Sunday night, we have a very interesting ritual, which I want to talk about. Okay? The night before Pesach, the night before the Seder, we have something called the checking of the chametz, the search for the chametz. What does that involve? What does it entail? Goes like this. On the night before the Seder, we go through our homes searching for chametz. Now this means you've already cleaned for Pesach. You've already cleaned for Pesach, right? For example, our shul, right? We're going to clean the shul for Pesach. Then we're going to, after we clean the shul for Pesach, I'm going to go through the kitchen with the blowtorch and and um, blowtorch the warmers. I don't know why you're laughing. I'm going to blowtorch the warmers. Sir, I need a permit for that one. <laughs> we blowtorch the oven because you know what? Rabbi Bigler, the, the words Rabbi Bigler and blowtorch should not be used in the same sentence. Rabbis are more handy than you think. They're more, they're more than they're more than more handy than they make themselves appear. So, so when we need to, so there you go. So we'll, we'll blowtorch the ovens, right? The the because they're not self cleaning ovens; they're warming ovens. And then we'll you'll notice we'll cover the counters with uh, materials to make a kosher for Pesach, and we'll be using only plastic, as you'll see. And that's it. And it will be kosher for Pesach. But still, on Sunday night, after you've already been cleaned, and we've already sold our chametz. We've already, so we don't own, there is no chametz, and it's sold. Now, there'll be parts of the kitchen that will be blocked off. They'll be blocked off. And I, and I would love to have a kitchen key. I'd love to have the kitchen locked. Because our kitchen in general, you know, people go in and they don't really know what they're doing in there. It would be very, very nice if our kitchen was lockable. So that the people that needed to go in would be able to go in. And those that didn't would not go in. Because it becomes very complicated. I mean, imagine a pace of somebody goes in, he's looking for something, and he goes into the chametz cabin and he brings it out. Oh, you know, that, that would be that would be a, a disaster. So it's, the chametz is covered up, put away, because we're selling it to the Gentile. And now, night before Pesach, we're searching for chametz. What do you do? It's a mitzvah to search for chametz the night before Pesach in your in your properties. And this would be from the time of nightfall this coming Sunday night. You're not allowed to eat. You're not allowed to do any labor beforehand. You're not allowed to even learn Torah from half an hour before nightfall, lest you become distracted so that you should not forget your obligation. Even if you did start one of these things like eating, learning, or uh, or some sort of activity, you have to stop from half an hour uh, before nightfall in order to prepare yourself for the checking of the chametz. If you want to learn and you ask your friend, that's you want to learn Torah, you ask your friend, you watch me and make sure that I stop at nightfall to remind me, then you're okay. He's not going to alarm. Then it's okay. Um, okay, but that's right. Now, uh, where do you have to check for chametz? Any place where there is a suspicion the chametz might have been placed all year round, even temporarily, needs to be checked, which basically means your entire house. Therefore, all the rooms of your house, the attic, the basement, the store, you have to check them for chametz in case there is chametz over there. Uh, baby strollers, your car. Your briefcase. Hmm. Now, what the reason for the check in the chametz is like this. This is the reason. The reason is like this. I have a locker I keep my tefillin in, for example, right? Is it possible that I put in a chametz candy in there during Pesach? During all your rounds? Probably very possible. So what you do is, could it be that during Pesach, somebody, will, one of my kids will stick his hand in my locker and find the, find the candy and start eating it on Pesach if it's not kosher for Pesach? It's very possible. So that's why you want to make... You want to make a, 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 a survey so that there's nothing left. Now, obviously, we're only human beings, right? And you only do can do what you can do. But don't give up and say, well, I can't possibly do anything. Do your best. There's a beautiful metaphor in the Talmud. It says that in the old days, they had very thick walls. They would, they would have these holes in the walls. They would store stuff in the walls. But how deep do you need to check into your wall for your, you know, these like holes in the walls to check the comments? So the answer is as far as your hand reaches. That's how, how far you have to check. 
you don't need to knock your house down in order to check the, what, what might be a, a three or, or four feet into the hole in the wall. You need to check as much as you can. So you're not obligated to 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 do uh, some sort of a um, forensic cleansing, but you are also not exempt from doing your effort, your best effort, right? So that's that's the reason you need to check. Look in your car. My kid could be in the back seat, or you know what? It could be. Um, Myself, I could forget that it's Pesach on Thursday morning. I could just forget that it's Pesach. And then um, because under my, my beam over there, I might have some candy and I might just, you know, some, some I don't know what, and I might just just put in, a, oh my God, I just had a Chometz and Pesach, God forbid, right? That's the reason why you want to do this checking, which basically means that there's nothing left behind. Every room needs to be checked. You have to clean it first. In order that you're not coming in, you know, doing all the work, it's going to take some time to clean for Pesach. Um, you got to clean under the beds, make sure no, especially Shalach Manis, you know, might, might some, find a Hamantash or something, you know, mm-hmm. the kids have their stashes, you know, they've been collecting, right? Um, okay. Um, you want to check in all the holes and the, and the crevices and all the hiding places in all the corners. The Shiva Bachers check in. No, sorry, you check in the, in the, in the holes. Only until your arm reaches, and then you can. The rest of it you can nullify. Now, what I, the reason what, what this means about nullifying is like this: is that the day, the, 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 right after you finish checking for chametz, then you say, "Look, God, I did everything I could to check for chametz. Whatever I didn't find is rendered ownerless." Hmm. Right? Announced. You know what a very good example is? A very good example is here in the shul. You know, there's all sorts of uh, alcohol bottles around the shul. You never know. Somebody like I see yeah, a couple of bottles right. out there. You never know. Somebody might have, you know, put by his talus bag somewhere a little bottle of alcohol, a little uh, emergency bottle of vodka. You know, you never know, right? And then uh, at the kiddush, you turn around and on Pesach, you turn around and there's like a little uh, uh, vodka party going on. Vodka is pure chametz. What do you think it's made out of? Right? It's made out of uh, grain. No, no, potato vodka is kosher for Pesach. Vodka is made out of grain. Vodka. Read the instructions. It's made out of wheat and barley. Certain brands. What you do is you have to make sure that it's not there for Pesach. Either you lock your locker for the whole Pesach, but if you don't lock your locker for the whole Pesach because you're using it, then you have to take it home, put it in the place that you lock up for Hametz. Right? So, for example, um, if you own a vodka factory, what do you do? You're not allowed to own it on a Pesach. Um, you're not allowed to own a Pesach, so what do you do? You can either burn it down before Pesach. That's one option. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Another option. Ah, uh, there we go. Mazel tov. He said sell it, so he's listening. Chuck is listening. What you do is you sell your, your, your factory for Pesach, and you don't own it during the eight days of Pesach, right? Now, what happens? I want to tell you something. What happens if you don't sell your chametz of Pesach? If you own the vodka factory, you, you own the beer distribution, you own a beer distribution with hundreds of thousands of, of, of bottles of beer, and you didn't sell it on Pesach, Hametz that was owned by a Jew on Pesach is forever prohibited, never allowed to be drank or, or eaten again, which means if you own a beer company and you didn't sell your Hametz, one of our members yesterday is a beer, uh, got married, is a beer uh, distributor. If you don't sell your Hametz, then that beer is, is verboten. For Jews. For Jews, which is why there's lists of companies that are published after Pesach, which says you're not allowed to buy this the, these these products. You're not allowed to, like let's say there's a store. Let's say I don't know Costco if it's owned by a Jew, which is not, but let's say it was right. And Costco, the person didn't sell chametz, then you're not allowed to shop in Costco until they get a new product, which would probably be a cycle of a couple months, right? You also can't benefit from it, right? Right. I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story. The guy, the Manhattan beer distributors, Manhattan beer distributors is a, is, a, is owned by a Jew. It's a massive beer company. And for several years, he refused to sell his chametz. He refused to sell his chametz. I wrote an article on anti-Semitism a few months, a few about a year ago. I wrote an article. Is this noise supposed to be happening? Is it right? There's like a pulsing noise. Is that right? Is that noise? Oh, fine. So, so this guy, the owner of Manhattan Beer Distributors, he somehow he received my email, an article that I wrote. About the how the Talmud explains the reason for anti-Semitism. <clears throat> it was a Talmud based on a Tosfos in Kedushin, which basically explains, you know, the world treats us in a double standard, right? What would happen if uh, if Iran attacked America? I'm just curious to know if Iran has attacked America with ballistic missiles. Do you think we would say? You think that uh, Biden would say we should be satisfied? 
that nobody got killed, and we should consider that a victory. There would be no more Iran. There would be no more Iran, Iran would cease to exist. It would exactly. be a crater. Absolutely. There would be nothing left to it, right? right. But I Israel, oh my know. God, Israel is not allowed to defend herself. Israel should be happy. You are so good that you are uh, that you did such a good job. Good little boy that you protected yourself. Wonderful, but you're not allowed to defend yeah, yourself. Really, this I is a double standard. The lesson of revenge. We are not allowed to right. Revenge. So this is this is uh, the double standard that Israel has been treated to. And the Tosfos explains in the Gemara, and this is what I wrote in my article. I explained that we have a double standard in our own lives. How much emphasis do you put into your grandchild's uh, college admissions? I'll let you answer that question yourself. And how much emphasis do you place on your grandchild's Jewish education? You'll notice a bit of a, a bit of a hunchback imbalance over there, right? I would say you probably put into your college admissions uh, 200% um, and into the Hebrew education. I'll show up to the bar mitzvah, right? <laughs> That's pretty much the extent of it, right? So it's, you may be putting 5% into the Jewish education, 200% into college admissions. It's when we have an internal double standard that, that this is from the Gemara, Therefore, the nations treat us with a double standard. That's what I wrote. Um, again, uh, you know, so, um, anyway, so this guy from the Manhattan Beer, Beer Distributorship, he got my email somehow through the Auschwitz Holocaust Memorial Museum. And he sent me a video, made a video of himself in Tefillin. And he says, I never met the guy. I still never, never spoke to him since this. But he sends me the video of him in Tefillin. And he says, I want you to know that you've inspired me. Your, your email was inspirational. And um, I, I understand that here I am, I put all my efforts into my business and I don't care about my Judaism. So I'm now wearing tefillin because I'm upping my game, right? So this guy, I was very proud. I, I'm not sure if he started selling chametz before or after my what email. What did he do with the beer? He sold his chametz. And I'm sure that he's selling his chametz right now before Pesach. I'm, I'm definitely sure that he's selling his chametz. I'm just saying the that. The same way we sold it. Exactly the same way he sold it, just that his chametz might be a little more valuable than... Uh, than yours or my still sell the beer. More beer. I think he has more alcohol than us. But he right. can still sell the beer. Yes, of course. He He's sells the beer. Selling. And therefore, it's kosher hey, for Pesach. No, the, uh, Whoever he's selling it, he doesn't sell it through me. No, no, he doesn't sell it through me. Anyways, bottom line is it goes. Let's keep on going. Now, it's, it's, it's customary to, to scrape off the benches and the chairs and the walls where Hamas might have touched. So, for example, the back splashes of your kitchen. Right? What are the odds that something splashed over there? Those chametz stick elevated, right? The the kitchen table, the you know the the, the little uh, you know the handles of your kitchen. Think about it, the handles of your kitchen. You never see them, but is it possible that it has some chametz stuff in there? Absolutely. Highly likely. These are the places that you're supposed to. That, by the way, where does spring cleaning come from? What does the expression spring cleaning come from? Mm. I believe that it comes from the Gentiles <clears throat> who observed the Jews going a little OCD in their cleaning springtime. So they were like, oh, I guess it's spring cleaning time, right? I believe that's where it comes from, at Pesach, right? Um, okay, so you got to try to wash it out. So do you want to check the pockets of your children's clothing, right? Because kids want to like go to them putting comments in there, right? Elevated. Um, <clears throat> what's going to happen? Keep on. Um, shoals need to be checked also the night before Pesach. The way we do this is, uh, we'll do it in a second, um, because kids bring chametz into all sorts of interesting little places. Before checking for chametz, what do you do? You're supposed to hide 10, crumb, 10 pieces of chametz. You're supposed to take 10, 10 crumbs, you wrap them up, not in tin foil, but in paper, because they can need to be burned tomorrow. So you want them to be not fireproof, okay? So you take these 10 pieces of chametz, there's a whole operation in my house where um, the kids hide the chametz around the house, and I, the father, have to now go and find the chametz, right? It's very exciting for the kids. Keeps them, keeps them up and awake. It's the reverse of finding them. It up, is. But... It's the reverse of such. A, it's very interesting, right? No, it's a very interesting observation. I wrote an article about that. You already one. scheduled your chametz barbecues to house. Chametz barbecue. What is a chametz barbecue? You cook all your chametz in a pit fire. In your backyard. You mean? Oh, I do that. Yeah, I do that every year before. When? We do it the morning of next Monday morning. Okay. It's going to be about ten o'clock in my house. You can come by my house and drop your chametz off. Yeah, next Monday morning, about about 10 o'clock-ish, 10.30-ish. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, pet food. Yes, friend, pet food is has to be kosher for Pesach, and I highly advise you to look online for kosher for Passover pet food because if it has chametz, you're not allowed to benefit from it on Pesach. If your dog is eating chametz, then you are eating, uh, you're benefiting, sorry, from that which is prohibited on Pesach. Now, so... So what do you do? You hide the 10 pieces. Why are you hiding the 10 pieces of chametz? Why are we hiding 10 pieces of chametz? Because in case your wife 
and your children, your family is so meticulous that they left not even a shred of chametz, right? Not even a trace of chametz, then you will have searched for chametz and not found anything. So in, in order to make sure for those, I, I, they might, the sages must have very high uh, expectations of us because they actually thought that some of us have nothing to find. Right when we search for chametz, but uh, yeah, we, we put out these ten pieces. They're kabbalistic. It's got a mystical significance to them as well. But on a very basic level, we put them out in order that the blessing should not be in vain. We're searching for chametz, and we found chametz. And what you do is you take um, these ten pieces of chametz to make sure that, they don't, that they're not going to make a, uh, make a problem. They're not going to exacerbate the problem. What you want to do is you want to make sure they don't crumble and leave crumbs around the house. They're like solid, hard pieces of chametz, um, and make sure they're all wrapped up in a piece of paper. Like we do, like a little plastic bag, so it doesn't um, it doesn't like crumble so this way we and there's a whole list it's very important there's a list i have one child i have 11 kids right so each kid get puts out a, chame, a thing of comments and one is in charge of the list so everybody's got a job and that way um everybody feels engaged it's very important to engage the children right to engage your children in your jewish traditions and um that way they check off daddy's list you know when daddy goes through the through the check in there oh, daddy you missed miss something look up look down right it's a whole exciting uh, encounter right um Okay, when you check, you need to have a candle, a bait of wax, and also you're supposed to have a uh, feather, like a feather of a fowl. So a candle and a feather, some also use a wooden spoon. It's I don't know the significance of all that is, but it's uh, you're supposed to use that kind of stuff. And you whatever you find, you whatever comments you find, you put into a paper bag. Put it all together, all these 10 pieces and whatever else you find. You make a blessing before you check. Who has sanctified us in his commandments and commanded us on the on the destruction of Hametz. From the time you make the blessing until you finish the checking, you're not supposed to talk about anything which is unrelated to the search for Hametz, um, only relating to the search. Like you can say, bring me a broom, please. I um, need a dustpan. I need another garbage bag. My candle went out, right? Um the family members should be near him to answer or main to the blessing. Each one should check in their own places. They shouldn't talk in the middle. They should be careful to um, to check right away without interruption. When they finish checking for chametz, they should put all the chametz that was found into this one bag with the feather and the uh, um, leftovers of the ten, the ten pieces and the there's a wooden spoon and, and the candle. You put it all nicely, wrap it up nicely so that it shouldn't spill overnight. And... You, you tie it together and you prepare for tomorrow morning where we're going to burn the chametz on Monday morning. I always thought the feathers was used to clean, get to the little, small little places where you, you can't like Yeah, yeah that's what it's for, of course. Of it's, course, that's what it's, it's for. It's show pans out there. That's potato vodka. That's okay, if there's a vodka, which, I, I don't know the brands. I don't do brands, but if you, um, it, yeah, if, if it says Kosher Passover, it's Kosher Passover. It's got to be a reliable kosher certification, though. If you Google Kosher for Passover pet food, there's a list Kosher for Passover pet food. I believe Blue Freedom, grain free. Is kosher for Passover. Same thing for medicine, friend. Yes, medicine also needs to be kosher for Passover. I said it last time. First thing you should ask is ask your doctor if what would happen to you if you didn't take the medicine. Because medicines are made with all sorts of, of, of mixed gray products, right? So if you can avoid taking the medicine for the eight days of Pesach, that would be the best. But if your doctor says you absolutely must take the medicine, the question is, is there a kosher for Passover alternative? If there's not a kosher... Why are you looking at me like that for? You think all the drug makers... Uh, no, no, uh, no, but there are no, there are there are other options. You don't have to have one option. You could go for a second option. In other words, some people can take a gel cap. Some people can take a tablet. The tablets are all made with stuff. So in other words, just giving it an example. So in other words, what you want to do is Chuck. What you want to do is you want to make sure um, you can Google it. Then you can search. Well, I have this condition. Are there any? Kosher for Passover medicine medications for this condition. And you'll see there's, there's, there's probably a thousand other people that have the same problem. And they've, they, they'll say, well, you know, you can take it. You can take this alternative. Ask your doctor if this alternative is good enough. And you discuss it. If you absolutely must need to take a medicine on Pesach, which is uh, uh, not kosher for Pesach, there's a way to do it. Um, in brief, what you do is you take you take the, uh, the the pill and you wrap it up in a in a piece of lettuce. And then you swallow it like that in a piece of lettuce so it doesn't actually even touch your throat. Um, it, what you're trying to do is you're trying to minimize the, um, any form of pleasure or, or, or swallowing. Okay, Denver, Colorado, Central Wars, Central Guards. Folks, we're going to stop right here. We're going to wish everybody a wonderful day. Uh, shalom and make it a great day. Take care. Eight o'clock.